morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this morning we're having some, well, I was going to say papers, one paper and the other a talk on Part 4A. Um, the last couple of years have been uh, interesting on Part 4A. There have been a number of decisions. Uh, two interesting things about the decisions is uh, that they're not part f the courts are no longer having to consider part for a in relation to scheme cases and what's occurred by and large over the last two years is the application of part for a to uh, commercial transactions to trans uh, affairs that have come into existence uh, outside promoters uh, flogging uh, tax advantages to um, taxpayers at the end of the financial year and by and large um, the Commissioner has had some success and the taxpayers have had some success. Uh, the other interesting thing about the cases that have been decided over the last two years is that they um, they read pretty well together. Uh, there's been little tension between the decisions, which is a very good thing for uh, practitioners in attempting to um, advise clients as to the present state of the law and as to whether Part 4A may or may not apply to whatever transaction they have or are about to enter into. Um, we have this morning two specialists in taxation to give us their insight into Part 4 a. Bill Oro uh, will talk uh, a little bit about the, the context in which Part 4A finds itself, both uh, in relation to uh, the legislation and also in relation to its use uh, and application to um, a variety of different types of uh, transactions. Melanie Baker will uh, follow and um, she will direct her uh, remarks to the decisions that have been handed down in the last two years. So if I can call on Bill. Good morning, everyone. I have prepared a very <coughs> detailed paper for this morning. Um, I will be giving you a um, somewhat cynical and perhaps critical view of the operation of Part 4A. Melanie will give you a more balanced view than mine. Um, it has been said that Part 4A is concerned with tax avoidance. Now, as you know, tax avoidance means different things to different people. But there are recorded instances of tax avoidance as far back as 6,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, where the king then imposed a bridge tax. And what people did effectively is that industry using boats thrived because people started to collect people from the edge of the river using a boat to the other side so as to avoid that particular tax. Now, you would have also heard about the windows tax that was adopted in the United Kingdom, which effectively uh, tax collectors walked around, looked at the number of windows you've got, and taxed you accordingly. Now, you might say, Bill, speaking of a stupid tax, there is an instance of it. Um, part 4A was enacted in a context, and the context included the former Section 260. Now, Section 260 was expressed in extremely broad terms to apply to every contract, agreement, or arrangement. Contract, agreement, or arrangement. That pretty much left nothing that you can think of that wouldn't fall in that category. That had the purpose or effect. If you take these two concepts disjunctively so as to each one be sufficient to trigger the operation of the section, then you'll end up with an instance where the pure effect is sufficient irrespective of purpose. Courts generally in that instance took those two concepts as cumulative concepts as, the, as opposed to alternative concepts. So every contract, arrangement, or agreement that had the purpose or effect of defeating, evading, or avoiding liability to tax. It was expressed in extremely broad terms so as to apply to just about anything you do that had the effect of diminishing your liability to taxation. 
Now, people engaged, obviously, in various transactions. Uh, much of 260 did not become an issue until late 50s, when we had what's called the Slutskin schemes and so on and, and such like. Tax avoidance started to become more serious. It became a more significant um, uh, industry. Judges looked at 260 and said, look, it is so broad, clearly Parliament did not intend to capture everything that will normally fall within its net. It had effectively a drift net effect. It caught just about everything. So judges had to impose some kind of a constraint on its operation. They developed a series of judicial limits. Uh, before I get to one of them, uh, I have noted uh, some instances where, I have come across instances where Justice Dixon said that it is impossible to avoid tax. Liability to tax falls by reference to the facts at hand. So whatever happens, for example, if I set up a structure involving a trust, then the trust has the ability to distribute income in a particular way, a liability tax follows by reference to present entitlement and such like. If you have a corporate entity, you have liability falling in that way. If I enter into a transaction, then liability to, to tax would follow that. He said, you simply cannot avoid tax. So what did the section mean? Courts developed what's known as the choice doctrine. And the choice doctrine basically says that where you have a choice, then in exercising that choice, that couldn't be said to be conduct of a kind that ought to be caught by the section. In other words, it cannot constitute an acceptable or impermissible forms of tax avoidance. Um, another doctrine that was developed, which is uh, by Justice Barwick, he spoke about the doctrine of change midstream. And he said, in circumstances where the taxpayer changes midstream, then there may be an argument that the purpose or effect of that particular arrangement was to avoid tax. If you don't change midstream, in other words, if you start with the appropriate structure, then it is harder to infer that the conduct was engaged in for the impermissible purpose, and that is the dominant purpose of obtaining a particular tax advantage. Newton's case came along and um, uh, Justice Denning, Lord Justice Denning, said, developed what's known as the predication test. The predication test simply says that if you look at an arrangement, if you can predicate that in, in the taxpayers engaging in it in the particular way they did, that they did it for tax avoidance purposes, then 260 would apply. Now, the High Court, uh, in I think it was spotless, referred to those doctrines and that notion was also restated in Hart's case by Gummo and Hain, referred, referred to those doctrines as muffled echoes from the past. You shouldn't listen to those. Are they really muffled echoes from the past? With respect, I say that the choice doctrine and the change midstream doctrine are very much alive and well, albeit the judges don't call them as such. They don't want to acknowledge they exist, but they are there, just like the air around us. It is there, you could deny it, but it is there. In the context of part 4A, if you start with an incorrect structure, incorrect from a tax perspective, you set up a structure, and the structure has a dividend block, or it has a, an instance <coughs> where the tax liability is higher than what it should be, and you want to move out of that into something else, the first question that arises, well, would part 4A apply? Had you started with the tax-effective structure from day one, the question of whether Part 4A applies wouldn't have arisen. So the change midstream argument continues to be relevant, even though everyone denies that it exists. The same thing with the choice doctrine. Taxpayers today have choices. They can make various choices. If you make the right choice at the beginning, then you're fine. If you, for example, place an asset in a corporate entity or in your name and then later on decide, well, maybe it should have been in a trust for capital gains and income tax, ordinary income tax purposes, then a question arises whether or not part for it would apply. Nevertheless, you exercise that choice. Now, nowadays we have an express, express choice doctrine in part for a but the only choices it accepts are choices that are expressly provided for in the Act. It's not just an implied choice, like a choice between company trusts and, and uh, such like. Um, 
Park Foray was enacted supposedly to, do, to provide a more defined notion of tax avoidance. Just as Sackville and Consolidated Press Holdings said, Part 4A is concerned with tax avoidance. Never define what tax avoidance is, but, but presumably the kind of tax avoidance that we're concerned with is tax avoidance that involves a scheme, which was, as pointed out, no one argues what a scheme is nowadays. You just take what's given. Uh, there has to be a tax benefit, and I'll deal with that very briefly shortly, and then um, a dominant purpose of obtaining that particular tax benefit. If you satisfy those, presumably what you end up with is the kind of tax avoidance that Parliament did not want you to have. Again, part three was enacted with the perception that it will provide a more defined notion of tax avoidance, whereas 260 was so <coughs> broad. It is ironic that I have no doubt in my mind Part 4A has a far broader operation than 260, even though supposedly it's supposed to have a narrower operation than 260. So what I suggest to you is this. It's not the words chosen by Parliament to tackle a particular problem when it comes to tax avoidance. It is the way judges interpret and apply it that matters. You give something like Part 4A to somebody like Justice Barwick, and in Peabody, where, for example, the commissioner defined the scheme in a certain way and then changed his mind, the matter was taken to the high court, and the high court said, oh, the commissioner can change his mind any time he likes. He can change the scheme at any point, even during the trial. He can change the notion and the scope of the particular scheme. What the full federal court said, no, you can't do that. Once you've defined the scheme, it will constitute a denial of natural justice to say to the taxpayer, look, I'm going to change it. You say it's too late. Once you've defined it, it's end of story. You've exercised your discretion by reference to the scheme you identified. The high court said no. If that went before Bowie, he could have easily said, yeah, the full federal court was right. So then the commissioner has to define the scheme, and if in any way it turns out to be a different scheme, the case fails. Whereas nowadays, that's not an issue because of judicial attitudes to it. So part four requires leave the question of determination by the commissioner. Three elements scheme, tax benefit, and uh, dominant purpose. Scheme is defined in extremely broad terms to just about capture anything you can think of. Uh, there was an expression used that it has to be, a, you, it must be possible for it to stand on its feet. And Justices Hain and Gamal ridiculed that notion. How could a scheme stand on its feet? It didn't occur to them that that was used in a metaphorical as opposed to a real sense. Um, Tax benefit, tax, the notion of tax benefits requires you to develop what's called a counterfactual. Uh, Justice Gummo, in one of these special leave applications, he says, I don't know what that means. What does counterfactual mean? Well, you have facts, and you say, well, if those facts did not exist, what would have happened? As I think Greg Davies has put it once, he said, what would have happened had what happened did not happen? So you look at it, you look at the facts, you say, if they didn't happen, what would have happened? The what would have, being the hypothetical scenario, is counter to the existing facts that have actually happened, and hence, it is counterfactual. So the notion of counterfactual does make sense. <coughs> but the presence of a notion like counterfactual tax benefit suggests that two taxpayers can enter into the same scheme, but because their circumstances are different, Part 4A, at least theoretically, can apply to one and not to the other. Why? Because the counterfactual would be necessarily fact-specific. Even though it's an objective determination, it's an objective determination by reference to the facts in the case that relate to the particular taxpayer. And the same thing in relation to uh, dominant purpose. Dominant purpose, of course, it, it also means that different taxpayers can get into the scheme and one of them will have the requisite dominant purpose, the other one doesn't, even though they both achieve the same tax-saving result. One of the problems that I perceive, excuse me, that I perceive with the operation of Part 4A is that it does not contain a filtering mechanism to tell us why it does not apply in some instances where it's not only dominant, the sole purpose is tax avoidance. Like salary sacrifice arrangements. Why would anyone uh, 
put money in a superannuation. Why? It costs you more to put money. You have no control over it. The only reason is because it's going to be taxed at 15%. Three years ago, when the treasurer said he can dump up to a million dollars in the super fund and it will be concessionally taxed, a lot of people ended up selling assets, incurring stamp duty to be able to put assets in their superannuation fund. If you want to apply Part 4A and apply a sole purpose test, Part 4A would still apply, and yet it never is applied. Why is that? Um, I have, in a, in, a, in, in a case recently, and it involves salary sacrifice arrangements. We don't have a decision on it yet. The commissioner said, salary sacrifice means you sacrifice salary that has not been earned. If you sacrifice salaries that has been earned, then it's not what he called a, an acceptable salary sacrifice arrangement. I had an instance where someone has sacrificed salaries that they have not earned. It's money they are not entitled to for services they have not provided, unequivocal. The <coughs> commissioner said part for I applied. And we, of course, argued, not only in addition to part for our arguments, we argued that the commissioner is bound by the public ruling. But leave that aside. The commissioner is applying part for a to something as blatant, to my mind, as that. So the notion I'm positing is this. Part for a can apply to a number of instances which clearly fall within its scope, but the commissioner does not apply it. Why is that? Perhaps there is some broader policy that tells the commissioner when Parliament intended to confer a benefit of a certain kind, and if and to the extent that Parliament intended to confer a benefit of a certain kind, it is not for the Commissioner to exercise his powers under Part 4A to deny that. Wouldn't it be better if we adopt a notion like the Canadians have? In their general anti-avoidance rule, they don't have any predication test, they don't have any counterfactuals. It's simple scheme arrangement, again defined in very broad terms. The tax benefit is any sort of tax saving or reduction in liability to tax. It's very similar to the state legislation, the Australian state legislation that is like 69D in the, uh, the Duties Act. And then they look simply to the, t to the dominant purpose. So the primary mechanism for the determination of when the Canadian general anti-avoidance rule would apply is the notion of dominant purpose. But they recognized that, hang on, there may be instances where despite the presence of a dominant purpose to avoid tax, Parliament wanted to confer that benefit. Because remember, tax is used for economic and social management. So clearly, sometimes Parliament imposes a tax in the hope of changing people's behavior. The Canadians recognized that, and they infused in their general intervenance rule the notion of misuse and abuse. They said, even if all the elements of the general intervention rule uh, are satisfied, if the conduct engaged in does not amount to misuse and abuse of the provisions and the policies that underlie it, then it is permitted. Now, that's an express recognition of legislative policy. So, for example, in the context of like the super contributions here and so on, you ask yourself, despite the fact that part fray may, be, uh, may apply in its terms, did the taxpayer engage in conduct that amounts to misuse and abuse of those provisions? The answer would be no, because clearly this is a kind of conduct that is contemplated by and permitted by Parliament. To that extent, Parliament could not have intended to hand one thing with one hand and deny it with part for a in the other. The notion of misuse and abuse, to my mind, even if is not expressly adopted in part for a it should be implied in its operation. I ran it last year before um, a judge in the federal court, and the case ended up decided on other grounds rather than part for a So this <coughs> case was, what I argued is that if and to the extent that the conduct did not amount to misuse and abuse of the provisions of the Tax Act, it ought to have been treated as contact that's contemplated and intended by Parliament and hence falls out outside the scope part for it. So you infuse it as an aspect of statutory interpretation because the moment you say to judges, you've got to imply something like that, they'll say, no, I don't want to do that. So you say, hang on, hang on. You are required to give effect to legislative intent, right? If you are, then this is an attribute of giving effect to that particular legislative intention.
So that wasn't dealt with. It was run again this year, and it'll be interesting to see whether this concept will eventually see itself emerging into Australian law. To my mind, um, it should be. Two problem areas I, I'll point out where Part 4A has presented some difficulty. I mentioned to you salary sacrifice. I do have significant difficulties with the application of Part 4A to wash sale arrangements, which you may recall Cummins' case. Uh, the federal court said, well, it applied. Now, in Cummins' case, there were some artificial steps infused in, and there were questions whether some steps were valid, like some loans and so on. But at the end of the day, if someone wants to realize a loss that is accrued but unrealized in a particular asset, they should be entitled to do that. Why does that constitute tax avoidance? Artifice or no artifice? In a sense, who cares? Part 4A shouldn't apply to it. So this is, to my mind, an instance where Part 4A should not apply, but it has applied. So now Part 4A is starting to take leaps forward in reaching transactions that, with respect, wasn't intended to reach at the time it was enacted. Um, that's all I want to say this morning, so I'll be curious to hear what Melanie has to say. Thank you.